All right, good afternoon. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and get us uh, started here with this afternoon's um, list of uh, presentations and panelists. And leading us off uh, first after lunch here is going to be Perry. Perry is a, um, a researcher with the Ethereum Foundation, and he's been testing a lot of the uh, Ethereum updates. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about testing, how we've changed stuff since the merge and how the testing stack looks today. Uh, to begin with, you might have realized there's a lot of things in the pipeline for Ethereum. So the question does come into play, how do you generalize testing? For example, how do you generalize it between Dankoon and between Verkle? Uh, the simple answer is you don't. Um, we tend to have a specific testing stack for each uh, upgrade, along with some inherited generalized testing from the previous steps. A good example of this is you're gonna have to look at the EIP, you're gonna have to read what parts of the stack are being changed, and you're gonna have to talk with client devs to figure out what they are worried about for the upgrade and try and address those problems first. Uh, for example, Peter has this really in-depth uh, PR about how the transaction pool changes for blobs. We just went through and everywhere where he had a concern or every single bullet point, we tried having something on the testing stack that addresses that bullet point. So what does testing look like today? What are we kind of covering? Um, we're, of course, covering the current fork, uh, that we're the current upcoming fork, so Denkun. Uh, we work on a potential future fork, so Verkle. Um, we're working on a couple of features uh, that might show up as a future fork. So you might have seen uh, Mikhail's talk earlier about deposits. Uh, so that's EIP 6110. So we have some testing for that. Uh, we have some testing for WISC, which is um, helping with validator privacy. There's a couple of testing stacks that are helping client teams optimize their clients. So we have... Um, we have like a testnet running for Ethereum JS to try and figure out how SnapSync works for them. We work on big boy beacon chain tests to figure out how big the validator set is. And as you can see, there's, there's, there's very few things that are shared between these topics themselves, but the problems that were ra raised between all of the testing sets were kind of general. So I'm gonna go through what those problems are and how we solve them. So the first one was the setup toil. So testnets used to have a lot of redundant configs, extremely easy to break them, extremely difficult to set them up. It was also very ti time consuming to add tooling to any sort of test, uh, testnet. And if I had set up stuff for one network and another one a month later, there was already a huge config drift. We, didn't, we hadn't built it in such a way that you could share updates between networks. So it depended really on who was working on what. So what we did was split everything into a lot of parts that make it way more easy to maintain. Uh, so we, we use Ansible for all of our testing, uh, for the test nets at least. So all the bare bones logic, such as this is a Teku node and it needs to be run on that machine. Or I need Genesis and Genesis files need to be moved to machine X. So kind of the bare, bare bones logic itself was moved into Ansible collection general. And then concepts or components were moved into their own tools as well. So Genesis is something that every network is gonna have to go through. So we simplified it and we have the Ethereum Genesis generator. So it's just very easy to configure, easy to toss in, and you can just use the output of that in the aforementioned bare bones logic tool. Similar to tooling, um, you would spend a decent amount of time configuring the tooling. So instead, what we did was we uh, switched to Kubernetes for tooling. So we have Helm charts. So there's a Helm chart that runs the Block Explorer, Helm chart that runs the Faucet, etc. And there's this cool concept called Git Ops, which is what you see in Git is what gets deployed on, on a Kubernetes um, stack. So we use Argo CD for that. So Ansible generates the Git configs. You commit it to Git, and the tooling just shows up, which is... Perfect, you never have to really think about tooling. Um, of course, there's some friction. The first couple of months getting stuff working well was a challenge, but I feel like we've gotten really, really good at this now. 
And the next problem was, okay, we have all of these parts and all of these abstraction layers. How do you, how do you bring them together? Um, GitHub has this feature called templates. So we're using that to create a template testnet. So that sets up the entire folder structure you need, all the same defaults you need, along with a readme on what values you should change. And on the top right, there's a nice button that says use template, and then it'll create, clone it into a repository in whatever namespace you want. And that has everything you need to make um, Kubernetes work, everything you need to make the testnet work. It's, it's kind of really a reduced set of changes to, to get everything up. Um, the next one was how do we keep explorers working? So explorers are really specialized pieces of software. Um, mainnet's getting bigger, mainnet gets harder to run, so explorers had to keep up. But the more they had to keep up, the harder it was for them to also support testing. And devnets are really weird dependencies. So a simple example is for Verkl, we need to have a lot of Verkl libraries. No realistic explorer is just going to import random libraries that they'd never use on mainnet onto that explorer. So we had to maintain a lot of forks. Um, that got harder as time went by. So we had someone in the team write a lightweight, self-hostable, extremely fork-friendly explorer. We call it Dora. Um, and that, that helped us. Uh, we could add a lot of features that we wanted into the explorer more easily and for smaller scale devnets as well. There was also some toil in getting Docker images working. So every single client team has their own CI, but they have their own logic as to when they push, which architectures they push, and so on. Um, a simple fix was to just host our own CI. So we build uh, Docker images for every single client out there. Sometimes we add some debug tools, but if nothing else, they're at least debug tool friendly. Um, and then we do them on hourly builds for branches that we track. And if we don't track the branch, you can also just trigger a manual build for whatever fork you want. Um, the next one where forks was really hard to debug. So every node on the network has its own version of what the network looks like. And when there's an issue, you kind of need to understand how the node perceives the network. Um, so we wrote a fork visualizer that uses the standard API. And then the uh, fork view was also integrated into the Explorer. So now it's actually easy to figure out how fork the network is. And then it gives you a good starting off point to know what you need to debug and where you need to start. The next one is a bit of a bigger topic. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer layer in Ethereum was really hard to analyze. Um, we didn't really have the tooling. And if, even if we did, it was built into custom to, uh, custom code bases for the clients, or they had metrics, but the metrics aren't really standardized. It was hard. There was no real analysis pipeline. So what we did was uh, the team built Zatu, which is a network monitoring, and added an, an, an analytics pipeline to that. So you have the entire suite you need to actually analyze the network. And what that looks like is a centralized server, so that's the Zatu server, uh, collects events from various sentries, which are just lightweight instances that run alongside the uh, EL and CL. And it connects to the CL's event stream, annotates stuff, passes it on to the server. And then the server handles persistence, passing it on to the pipeline, and so on. Uh, we also have a discovery node that just kind of crawls the DHT and figures out what's going on in disk v4. Um, and we have Mimicry, which is a tool that collects a lot of information about transactions. So an example might be that you want to know when a transaction was first seen on a network versus when it was included in the network. Depends on what your use case is, but at least we're collecting that kind of data to understand how the network behavior is. And then Canon is a client that backfills data so that it, it helps for historic uses as well. Uh, we have a nice overview on the notes page, so have a look about that one. And we do run this stack. So we're running it on mainnet, Sepolia, Gurley, uh, Hulski. We run it on all the blob dev nets, at least the latest ones. So that gives us a really good insight into how the network is actually looking. Um, and we can do overview graphs like this. It's a bit of a chaotic screen. I apologize for that. But you can have heat maps on when attestations are seen, heat maps on when the blocks are propagated. You can have a graph that tells you, oh, if there was one blob the block took so long to propagate. If there were six blobs, it took X plus 100 milliseconds to propagate. And that gives you a lot of deep ana analytics into, OK, maybe there's some assumptions we made wrong. Or worst case, it reinforces the assumptions that we did make. 
And the last one I want to talk about is that it was really hard to test changes quickly. Um, earlier, we needed to spin up a network, or you had to maintain verbose shell scripts. It was just extremely difficult to just test an update. So we switched to using local testing along with a tool called Kurtosis. So Kurtosis allows you to specify a config, either in JSON or in YAML. Here, here's a JSON example for how you spin up a local network with three uh, Nethermind as well as Lighthouse nodes. Um, it handles Genesis for you, it handles everything that you really need. Um, and because it's a testing suite, it does some smart things. You can change the slot time, so and you can change when the fork happens. So within a matter of a few minutes, you can have a local network with every single CL and EL out there. Um, and know if a fork is successful or will fail. And we often do this to sanity check stuff. And we've even added the um, MEV workflow, so you can have uh, the entire relay infrastructure set up, and it can help with either local integration or to just sanity check things or make sure that your fork works well. And the nice part is that it supports both the Docker backend as well as the Kubernetes backend. So if you do want, you can point it at Kubernetes and get a more scalable setup with X nodes over certain regions. So it really, really helps us with testing rapid iterating changes before we put in the effort for a full-scale devnet. And here's how the testing workflow kind of looks, to, looks like today. It's not a comprehensive workflow, but at least it gives you an idea. Um, you have the specs. Specs get released after a lot of work from researchers. Um, the clients work on this in a fork or a branch. Um, parallelly, there's this testing tool called Hive. Hive is you can think of it like you pass it an input and an output, and Hive asserts if it uh, sets up the network and asserts if it's doing what it should be doing. So Hive gets updated, and because Hive is extremely powerful and we're already able to think of a lot of scenarios where clients might fail, we push all the client teams to first test on Hive. So everything that we can expect and can catch, we have caught at this step. And if we've done that, then we start using local test nets with Kurtosis. And that gives us the sanity check that, hey, if we spend half an hour, an hour, two hours setting up a network, it's not going to fail immediately. Um, and then we can start up full feature devnets. Um, and if you have noticed from the devnets for uh, Dencoon versus the devnets we used to have for, uh, for the merge, they stop outright failing anymore. And the reason is because we've pushed for a lot of um, changes upstream to catch all the bugs that we can upstream way faster than we earlier could. And whatever we can't catch, there's what be what's being caught on DevNets now. That's great from a cost perspective, time perspective, from a lot of different ways. And once we're happy with DevNets, we typically tend to have a public testnet or one that's more announced and supported. So external parties, explorers, tools can start using it, start integrating it. And once that's working well, we tend to have this concept called shadow forks, where you fork a main network, but in, in on the side, you don't affect the main network. Uh, and this helps us get metrics about um, how, how that, that fork would have potentially gone in your, in your side chain. And once we're happy with that, we tend to go for public test nets as well as main net shortly after. So that's roughly how that's going to look. And what kind of tests we run for the different layers of the stack, you have, um, depending on if it's EVM changes, and we rely heavily on fuzzing or on fuzzy VM and tools that compare how the EVM output looks between different clients. Uh, if it's peer-to-peer -peer layer, we have chaos testing tools. We have uh, devnets that we run. If it's Engine API based, we tend to do more static testing. Uh, if it's sync, then we tend to do sync tests and so on and so on. We have, we have a lot of tool sets for different layers of the stack. And here's kind of the, the question, where is Dencoon today? Um, we did have a small spec change that has been added not too long ago, and it's being implemented in all the clients. I think the spec change is partly caused by some of the outputs from the testing, partly caused by researchers thinking about the problems a lot more. Um, and this is going to help us simplify a lot of things and make sure that Dencoon is a lot more safe once it's uh, hitting mainnet. Once that spec change is implemented, we're going to be doing a public devnet. So we'll have devnet 12, and we'll have a lot of shadow forks. So we're looking to have bigger shadow forks this time, like a couple hundred nodes, uh, 
and that will give us a decent amount of time into how long a network takes to process. It'll give us a decent amount of information about uh, basically everything that we would need to know before we can commit to public test nets. And once we're done with that, we're gonna pa parallelly start forking public test nets. So we'll most likely suggest Gurley, Holsky, and Sepolia, and that'll give us uh, information on how a really big network is gonna behave with blobs in it. And in the last couple of months, we have two big tools that are interesting. So we have Blobber from Mario from the testing team. And this is an evil man in the middle peer-to-peer -peer layer tool that sits kind of between the validator as well as the beacon node. And the Blobber decides which part of the network gets honest messages and which part of the network gets malicious messages. And this is a really, really interesting way. You can create a lot of scenarios which we didn't earlier have the capability to create. And the second one is AttackNet. Um, so this is using a chaos testing framework. Uh, we're using Chaos Mesh and it's a collaboration between like Trail of Bits, EF DevOps, and Kurtosis. And this would allow us to push the network on different layers of the Linux stack. So you can mess with um, the network latency, you can mess with um, packet drop, you can mess with CPU faults, RAM faults, you can add latency to the uh, read and write from the disk, you can do a lot of things here. And we just started using this tool, so hopefully we're not finding anything too big, but it's gonna be interesting over the next couple of weeks at least while we parallelly go ahead with, uh, with Denkun. And what does Denkun mean for the home staker is always a big question. Uh, so based on the last couple of devnets, it looks like there's only gonna be a marginal increase in CPU and RAM. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a big one, so you don't have to worry about going out and getting a new machine for supporting Denkun. There is an increase in disk use, roughly 50 to 100 gigs. It really depends on, um, on the values that we choose for the network. And that's what we're focusing on a lot of testing over the next couple of months to figure out those values. There is an increase in network use. So you can imagine roughly 100 kilobit kilobytes per second up and down increase. Um, so yeah, this there is some amount of spiky behavior in this. So it depends if there's suddenly a lot of transactions that get added to the mempool, then you have to go fetch them from your network and it might be more than 100 kilobytes, but it's on average at least. And there is some increased read-write um, pressure on the disk because there's a presence of blobs as well. There's a new piece of the puzzle that gets added in, right? Um, and one of the things we were really glad to have tested and are extremely surprised about was that tests on ARM machines showed that they were great. Uh, we had some help with the Ethereum on ARM folks. They're, uh, they're here this week. Um, and it looks like they're able to track devnets perfectly fine. Uh, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be able to do public testnets as well. Um, it shows that at least when it comes to tracking the chain, there's no added latency. And it could have been that it was worse than we had expected, purely because we're adding a lot of new libraries into 4844. So it could have been that one of them was not optimized for ARM machines, but it seems to work beautifully, which is awesome. And yeah. All of these values kind of still depend on um, hard to model transaction pool behavior. So we we will be, so as much as we try to do devnets and shadow fox, et cetera, it's almost never going to represent how mainnet looks like. Mainnet has 10,000 nodes, 10,000 plus nodes, and we're not gonna be running a network with 10,000 plus nodes. So it's gonna be hard to nail down exactly the metrics you need for such a network. So the only place we will be able to get them is on networks like Gurley, Holsky, et cetera, which is why we're looking forward to um, having tools that I've mentioned earlier like Zatu, which would gain a lot of deep insight into how the network looks and how that's gonna go. And what next? Um, an open call to ask people to get involved in Denkun testing. Um, so sync a node, we have DevNet 11 live now. Uh, most of the guides that you would have used for previous test nets would still work. Um, we should have DevNet 12 up once once we're all back home, I guess. Uh, submit blobs. It I think a lot of the ecosystem hasn't necessarily started using blobs for testing yet, and it would be nice to start um, so that once the upgrade does go live on mainnet, 
you're actually seeing stuff and break things. Uh, one thing we did notice in merge testing was that when regular people start getting involved in syncing stuff, we tend to find a lot of behaviors that we didn't find otherwise, behaviors that we couldn't have modeled otherwise. So please try syncing nodes, submitting blobs, et cetera, and then raising issues in case you're finding them. Most client teams have started merging uh, their their uh, Denkun code into their master branches. So you could potentially even just use the latest release or the latest master version to uh, join one of these dev nets. So that's uh, mostly it. And thank you. Um, help testing the surge. And you can find all the tools I've list linked and everything under the ETH Panda Ops organization on GitHub. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. We do we do have uh, a time for a few questions here. Okay, Barry Kardos. Uh, yeah. One question I have is, what is the biggest difference? Like, what are the differences between test net workloads and main net workloads? Like, what are the biggest differences you have observed? Like, one testing on Gorli or Holski. Uh, let's let's take Gorli and versus on main net. Like, so what are the biggest differences you observe between testing on main net? Like? So one of the really big ones and one that took a while for us also to figure out how to test is that 4844 and Denkun is largely a peer-to-peer -peer focused upgrade. Um, and that's really hard to model. We needed a lot of tools to be able to actually view it. There was a lot of things that you, you still can't model. Um, so that's one of the major things. And people tend to use a lot of esoter esoteric tools that we might not even know about. You might have staking setups that use Windows machines. We don't test on Windows. You might have um, vouch running. You might have DVT setups. You might have a lot of these different things that we just don't have the bandwidth to realistically test. So we test the default, which is you have an EL, CL on one machine, has pretty perfect uh, setup. And public test nets show us that that isn't the case. And that's, that's what we hope to learn from them. I have a question. Yeah. It seems like a lot of these tools would be perfect for an attacker to just like take off the shelf and use or take off the shelf and modify a little bit and use to attack mainnet. How do you think about the relationship between what you build to defend the network versus like it also being an open tool to attack the network? I think very often before we fully open source the tool, uh, we also try to attack or think about how to attack the network and then make sure we're at least mostly resilient to it. Um, yeah, as always, it's impossible to have every case covered, but we at least try to go through a bunch of um, bunch of things. And if, if it's something we notice uh, is completely horrible, if we release it today, we also don't release it. Uh, you can try searching for attack net, you won't find it online. Um, that's, that's like a prime example. We, we try to hold back tools that would be too dangerous until we're quite happy that we're not able to find anything with them. And most of the uh, ways we present our guides, et cetera, is more meant from a researcher slash from a observer point of view rather than from a attacker view. Yeah. Where do you think the most under-tested portions of the stack are at the moment? Ooh. I think a lot of it is still in the unexpected scenarios on the peer-to-peer -peer layer. Um, it seems like we're just starting to get good at testing the peer-to-peer -peer layer. We haven't finished that cycle yet. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's the main one. Um, I would actually look forward to a simpler fork that, <laughs> I don't know, every time someone talks about like workers, like, okay, it's a nice box, there's a database change, you can do like a million shadow forks, and if it works a million times, it's gonna work the million and first time. Um, and same for EOF, they're extremely confident that a lot of fuzzing takes care of a lot of issues and you tend to treat the EVM as a nice black box that's packaged for us and the client devs worry about it. Um, but when it comes to 4844, we couldn't do that. It, it, it's a live network and we do have to test it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Please, another round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.